Well, hello and welcome to The Zone. I'm your host, Big Wave Dave. What kind of stupid name is that? So today we're going to talk about the six days of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Objected to as assuming facts, not in evidence. And the Bible tells us that he did all of that in just six days. But the Bhagavad Gita, which is centuries older than the Bible, implies that the Hindu Godhead created life on earth closer to 4 billion, 320 million years ago, which is much, much closer to the actual age of the earth, according to science. And science really should override even our favorite folklore. After all, Protestant Christians like to say that Catholics are not Christian at all. And if they're not, then Christianity is only the fourth largest religion after Catholicism. And there are more Hindus than Protestants or even Catholics. No matter what your religion is, you'd have to agree that most of the world is heading in what you would call a wrong direction because of their faith. So faith is unreliable. We need instead an objective measure that is dependent on actual factual evidence rather than adherence to tradition that can only be followed on blind credulity. Let's take a closer look. On day one, God created earth, space, time, and light. Except that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't even imply whether God created space and time. Space time was already here. In fact, the earth was already here because the creation week was written poetically. And one possible interpretation is to imagine that you're standing outside in the dark, when it is darkest before the dawn, as they say. Then, as you scan the horizon, you perceive that there is light in the east, but not all at once. It's not like turning on a light switch. Instead, you notice that as the moments pass, the sky slowly begins to illuminate. As it does, that puts the land in contrast, still in the dark, formless and void, because you can't yet discern any details. Note that at this point in the poem, which could be about the coming dawn, representing a beginning, you can't yet make out any details in the land or the sea because they're still shrouded in darkness. And while there is already light in the morning sky, we have not yet seen the sun. Which, you know, kind of brings up a question. How could there have been a day without the sun? Because that wasn't created until later. There is an answer. Wrong answers don't count. I know that your favorite fairy tale says that the earth was the very first and most important thing to exist at the center of the whole universe. But the Bible is not even on speaking terms with reality. And not everyone is a pretender imagining a world of make-believe. Some of us care what the truth is. And the science shows that the earth didn't begin at the same time as the rest of the universe, assuming that the universe began at all, which some cosmologists doubt, because matter apparently always existed in some form, so there was never absolutely nothing. And the Earth formed roughly 10 billion years after cosmic inflation. And our world wasn't a water ball then, either. The scientists say that the Earth started out as a mostly molten accretion of rock, metal, and gases, onto which water and other substances were evidently introduced by a long-running, near-continuous battery of comets and such, as gravity slowly formed our planet out of the dust already in orbit around the newly formed Sun. Let's take a look. So what is the definition of a day? One day is one rotation of the earth. So you see, we don't need the sun or the stars or anything else. We only need the earth to have a day. Ah, but you still need something to light the earth because your story says that God separated the light of day from the dark of night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. You can't have an evening and morning if all you have is the earth itself and nothing else to relate to it. Like so many elements of folklore, original meanings are often lost to new interpretations. The Bible provides many examples of this, as it is based on or influenced by so many elder myths from neighboring religions with very different original meanings. Thus, a story that could have originally been about how the morning first lights the sky against a shapeless horizon before we can see trees and such, and then detect the movement of animals, was later revised, such that each stage of this morning is seen as a sequence of things being created over a sequence of days by later editors who may have not understood the original illustration. Let's talk about day two. On day two, God created the atmosphere. Objected to is argumentative, assuming a fact not in evidence, leading and suggestive, and utterly incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial. The Bible does not say that God created the atmosphere. Nor does Genesis say what Bisbee has quoted here. 
Instead, the King James Version and the American Standard Version both say that God created a firmament. What is that? Well, the Common English Bible and the Complete Jewish Bible both explain that it is a dome. The concavity, or the underside or inside of this dome, is called an expanse, which is the word used in the Darby translation and in the English Standard Version, which Bisbee claims to be quoting from here. Except that the ESV says that the firmament is an expanse, not a huge space, which would be another interpretation of expanse in a different context, which is inapplicable here. Because this is supposed to be a translation of the Hebrew word rekia, which means a slab of solid material the shape of which could imply an expanse within. Bisbee has chosen a different use of an English word because the original Hebrew word doesn't work for his interpretation. So he altered his sacred scriptures, changing the alleged word of God deceptively to make it look like it's talking about an atmosphere. But we know better than that for a few reasons. One, because verse 2 already said that the Spirit of God moved over the surface of the waters. The people who wrote that were obviously talking about the wind, because the ancient authors didn't yet know that air was particulate matter, but they knew you would die if you couldn't breathe. So the early Hebrews, and other primitive people too, thought that air was supernatural, spiritual. I'm not going to go in explaining all of the different ways that we know that now, because that's a whole long discussion unto itself that I'll have to cover in another video. The point is that the text illustrates that the atmosphere already existed. It wasn't being created now. Another way that we know that this isn't talking about the creation of an atmosphere is because elsewhere the Bible explains that God stretched out the heavens like a canopy or a tent, except that he made the firmament as a strong and hard, solid crystal dome, looking like a mirror made of metal or glass. He anchored that to the pillars of heaven, and God called this solid vault of the heavens sky, so that the heavens are supposed to be the inside of a giant mirrored dome. The primitive people who wrote the Bible way back when thought that the earth was like a map divided into four quadrants, sometimes mistranslated as corners, described with the word for circle, not the word for sphere. This disk was then erected on columns like a table and covered by a giant domicile called a firmament. So the earth was like a snow globe, but in reverse, being like a bubble of air in an endless sea. Because the people at that time believed that there was water above the vault of the sky. And what we now know as outer space, they thought to be an eternal abyss. The story goes that where there, there were physical windows in this giant crystal dome, which could be opened to let the rain in from outer space. Or if the windows in the sky were closed, then the rain could drain out through the fountains in the bottom. Of course, this violates gas laws, but they didn't know about things like atmospheric pressure back then, because they thought that air was the spirit of God and the breath of life, being supernatural and thus without weight or displacement. And this concept of a solid dome over a flat disk world, although completely wrong, was common across much of Asia by that time. For example, in a Chinese myth, an enraged warrior went to the top of a mountain and ruptured the firmament with his spear, causing a cataclysmic flood. Then the Naga goddess Nu Kwa had to come repair the firmament and clean up the mess. We really shook the pillars of heaven, didn't we, Wang? Now the atmosphere is so important. It gives us air to breathe and helps keep us warm. And it also protects us from the sun's harmful rays and from meteorites when they hit the earth. Well, they're called meteorites after they hit the earth, when it's too late for the atmosphere to do anything about that. Instead, the atmosphere offers some protection from small meteors, which is what they're called before they hit the earth. Day three, God created the dry land and the plants. No, he didn't. Instead, it says that God let the dry land appear. And this is another verse illustrating how the people of that time had no knowledge of the true nature of the earth, wherein this verse would be impossible, absurd. So the next time you go on a hike, stop and take a look around. Look at all the different plants that God created, grass and bushes and trees and flowers. In 1735, Carolus Linnaeus invented taxonomy initially because he recognized a hierarchy of related groups throughout botany. And that was a mystery in his time, but it was eventually explained a century later by evolution. Speaking of flowers, I have a question. Why did God make flowers so beautiful? Well, I think it's because he wanted us to enjoy his creation. Do you think that's why God made mosquitoes? 
Is that why he made parasites or infectious bacteria? And how about goat head stickers that stab into our tender, unprotected feet? What about poison ivy? But you know, plants do more than just look good. They're really important. For example, they provide oxygen that we need to breathe. And of course, they also provide food. Now what's really cool is when you cut into fruits and vegetables, you'll often see little seeds. And we can take those seeds and plant them to produce more fruits and vegetables. It's God's way of making sure that we have enough food. He thought of everything. Except that he didn't think of anything because evolution by genetic drift or natural selection are autonomous processes, increasing biodiversity literally without a thought. And unguided evolution actually explains all of this, where creationism is just pretending that everything was poofed out of nothing by magic. Okay, so day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. This may be the single stupidest verse of the whole Bible, though there is stiff competition, because this verse assumes that the earth was the first and most important thing at the center and the very beginning of everything everywhere. As if it took four days for God to mold and craft this one little rock that we live on, and even taking a whole day just to dust it with seeds, yet innumerable galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stellar systems, all more complex than our tiny world, were sneezed out all at once on a single day? Shouldn't each of those other rocks have required at least a day each to build? Obviously, the people telling the story didn't know about those other galaxies or those other stellar systems. They thought that the Earth was the biggest thing in the universe and that the stars were just little lights decorating the dome of the sky. And trying to defend and retrofit a literal interpretation of those scriptures today defies reason. So I have a question. Some people say that the six days of creation weren't actual days, that they may have been thousands or maybe millions of years. Well, there's a problem with that. Let's take a look. The Bible teaches that God created plants on day three, but he didn't create the sun until day four. Now, if it's just one day, a 24-hour period, that's no problem. But if it's thousands or millions of years, how would the plants survive? The simple answer, they wouldn't. The reason that this story is divided into seven different days, six of creation and one of divine nap time, is that the Genesis creation myth is apparently based, at least in part, on an earlier creation myth, Enuma Elish, wherein instead of seven days, the Babylonian story is recorded on seven tablets, which tell how the world was created by as many generations of gods, where the sixth generation decided to create man in their own image so that humanity could complete the work of creation, allowing the seventh divine generation to rest. And remember that Enuma Elish is a thousand years older than the book of Genesis, and the culture who wrote it included the grandfathers of the biblical authors. Speaking of the sun, God did a really good job at designing the sun. Here are some interesting facts. First, the Earth is just the right distance from the Sun. If we were any closer, it would be too hot on Earth. If it was any further, it would be too cold. No, like most of what Bisbee says, this too is wrong. The Earth has an elliptical orbit, which varies by millions of miles, moving nearer to or farther from the Sun. And the Earth is closest to the Sun when the Northern Hemisphere is in the coldest part of winter. And we're furthest away from the Sun when we're in the heat of summer. What more determines whether we are hot or cold is the blanket of atmosphere. Venus is hotter than we are, not just because it's closer to the sun, but because it is enveloped by greenhouse gases, which are almost completely absent on Mars. Swap those two planets, and they would both benefit. If the Earth were either in Venus's orbit or in Mars's orbit, our situation wouldn't necessarily be that much different either way, depending on how we adjust the atmosphere which is analogous to how we add or remove blankets when it's too hot or too cold. Also, the sun is the right size and type. It gives us just the amount of energy we need to sustain life on Earth. What we call the Goldilocks zone, being just the right distance to be safe yet warm, can vary. We can be quite a bit further from a blazing forest fire than we would sitting next to a campfire, so exoplanets in other systems can be closer to smaller suns and further from hotter ones and still be, in effect, where we are. And finally, the sun is remarkably stable, 
much more stable than a lot of the stars that we see out there. At least Bisbee recognizes that the sun is a star, which the Bible authors obviously didn't know, because they said that the sun and the moon were both lights without any recognition of the fact that the sun was bigger than the earth, and so were all the other stars. The ignorant primitives who wrote the Bible said that God created the sun and that he made the stars also, as if the stars were something different, as if the sun was not a star itself. And they said that the stars, too, were set in the vault or the expanse of the firmament, like stringing up Christmas lights which is another way that we know that the firmament, vault, or expanse was not referring to an atmosphere. Does Bisbee really think that God set the stars in the atmosphere? However you interpret it, this verse is factually false. The idea that any of these stars, which are all larger than the earth, exist to give light to the earth is another verse that proves that the story was written from the position of someone standing on the earth with absolutely no understanding of any other perspective. So, have you ever wondered, why do we need the moon? Well, obviously it puts out great light. No, it doesn't put out any light. I know the Bible says that God created the sun and the moon as two great lights, but that's just one more of many things the Bible got wrong. Everything the Bible says about the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos is laughably wrong. The moon is not a light, and it does not put out any light. It only reflects the light from the sun. But it does something even more important. The moon is what causes the ocean tides. You see, the gravitational pull of the moon on the earth causes the earth to bulge, and that causes the tides to rise and fall. And that's really important because it keeps the water mixed up, which helps the animals that live in the ocean stay healthy and happy. And where does the Bible explain any of this? The reason it doesn't? is because it was written by ignorant primitives who obviously didn't know about any of this. They thought the world was flat, and that the sun and the moon were both smaller than the earth, and about the same size as each other. The diameter of the sun is about 400 times larger than that of the moon, but it's also roughly 400 times further away. However, from a terrestrial perspective, they both look to be the same size, and both of them look to be smaller than the earth, as if they're moving through our sky while we stand still. Thus, the fallible human authors of the Bible says that the sun and the moon were both set in the vault of the firmament. So they're both the same distance from the earth as well, according to this fable. You know, I love the way that the Bible says God made the stars. Like, ah, no big deal. That's right. No explanation at all. Just PFM. Pure fucking magic. It's like the Native American belief that coyote made the mountains and the rivers and created trout. As if all the gods simply wish things into being, and we foolish mortals, some of us anyway, swallow these fables blindly, without question, reservation, or reason. How many didn't he make? Well, scientists have been trying to figure that out for years. Here's the latest guess. Wow, that is a lot of stars. What, what's even more amazing is the Bible tells us that God knows each of those stars by name. We have an amazing God. What's even more amazing is how anyone believes such impossible nonsense for no good reason and against all reason. And you ignore the fact that when the Bible was writ, they didn't know about that many stars. Instead, they said that the stars were put there to mark signs and seasons and sacred times because they believed in astrology. Remember that these people also believed that the stars could fall from the sky to land on the earth. Remember when Jesus said that? He obviously didn't know what the stars even are. He thought they were tiny lights made to stand in the span of the expanse of the dome of the ceiling. But the stars are not high in the firmament. There is no firmament. And the stars are so far beyond our puny world that height is meaningless and inapplicable. The stars are much too far away to be blown out of space by any storm, and they couldn't be taken down by anything at all. Even if they could, we still couldn't stomp on them because they're each thousands or millions of miles around, which makes it a bit silly to imagine a whole group of them having conscious minds and ganging up in combat with a mere human being. And we also know that the sun cannot be made to set at noon, and that neither the sun nor the moon can be stopped in the sky, and that there are no pillars holding the earth above the deep because there is no deep. Outer space is not full of water. Okay, so God's got everything all set for what he's going to do next. On day five, God created the sea and the flying creatures. 
Wrong again, as always. The fable says that the sea was already here on the first day and divided into different seas on the second day, and now he's just stocked the water with fish and the sky with birds because the ancient people had no concept of taxonomy. They classified things by what they did rather than what they are. And that's why the Bible says that bats are birds and whales are fish and so are lobsters. So my dad used to be a scuba diver and he's gone all over the world and brought back pictures of hundreds of different types of fish. It's amazing how many there are. Yet there is no reason for a creator to create all these myriad varieties especially not when they are all obviously interrelated and evolved from various levels of common ancestry through a natural process of biodiversity. And of course, sea creatures don't just include fish. They include creatures like whales. Now, if you've ever studied whales, you'll discover that they are absolutely amazing. Especially if you study their evolution via the many transitional intermediates now known for their lineage. Obviously, somebody really smart made them. Obviously, someone really stupid believes that whales were magically created, but we know that they started out as land animals. We have all the evidence necessary to prove that now. But believers going to believe, and keep believing even when they have absolute proof that what they believe is wrong. You know, sea creatures also include things like sea turtles and eels and octopus, and hundreds and hundreds of other types of animals. And they all fall into taxonomic categories corroborated by their appearance in the fossil record, confirming their evolution many millions of years ago. Now, on day five, God also made the flying creatures. So when I hear that, the first thing I think of is birds. You know, birds are so cool. They come in so many different shapes and sizes and colors. And their evolution from dinosaurs is well documented in the fossil record, which makes a lot more sense than saying that God created all different kinds of all sorts of birds when birds should be a kind or sort unto themselves. Except that the Bible got even that wrong by saying that God only created winged birds on day five and that he didn't make kiwis or emus or terror birds until day six because they were land birds that didn't have wings and don't fly. But it does include more than birds. It includes things like dragonflies and bats and insects. Dragonflies and insects? Dragonflies are insects, just like bats are mammals, not birds, and whales are mammals, not fish. But the people who wrote the Bible had no understanding of anything, and sadly their ignorance is contagious, being passed down for generations. And let's not forget about these guys. Should I point out that there were dozens of different species of pterosaur within two clear subgroups that are now all extinct, because none of them were preserved on Noah's Ark. Now we put together a really fun video on dinosaurs. I hope you check it out. I did. It had so many mistakes in it that my rebuttal video was a feature-length movie taking an hour and a half to correct all of Bisbee's errors. Have you noticed that listening to Bisbee always sounds like we're getting a science lesson from Barney Rubble? And no wonder he thinks humans lived with dinosaurs. Okay, for the final day, day six. On day six, God created the land animals. All different kinds of land animals. It's amazing all the different varieties out there. What's interesting is that the Bible says that God created the creatures according to their kinds. You will see that phrase over and over again. Well, what's a kind? The only definition given in the Bible uses the Hebrew word min, referring to two animals that are related closely enough that they can still interbreed and you know, produce fertile offspring and thus bring forth after their kind. But this is also the same definition as the biological species concept, wherein interfertile individuals are considered the same species, while different species in the same genus might only produce infertile hybrids, and different genera in the same family wouldn't be able to produce anything viable anymore because of how genetic divergence increases as species grow apart. However, the Bible gets even this wrong when it categorizes numerous different species of cattle as one kind and creeping things as another kind as if every member of each group were all the same kind, even though they cannot bring forth with the others anymore, and thus should be different kinds by the only definition given. Well, scientists are busy working on figuring out what animals belong to each kind. But let me give you a few examples. So we have a lot of different kinds of cat, but one cat kind. And we have all different kinds of dogs, but only one dog kind. And so on and so forth. 
It is true that all extant cats can interbreed and produce something, even if those hybrids are infertile and have genetic issues. But if we use the only definition the Bible provides for what a kind is supposed to be, then dogs are not all the same kind, because domestic dogs cannot interbreed with foxes, nor with most species of wild dogs either. And while they are all obviously related, both morphologically and genetically, domestic dogs that were derived from wolves cannot interbreed with African painted dogs, nor with Asian raccoon dogs, nor South American bush dogs. All dogs show a genetic relationship to bears, too, yet you have bears listed as a separate kind, even though bears and dogs and weasels and pinnipeds, which are missing from your chart, are all conoidian carnivorans. You've got several dozen species in most of these alleged kinds, to say nothing of the transitional intermediates between them in the fossil record, like bear dogs and dog bears and seals that can still walk around on land. Then you've got red pandas all by themselves as their own kind, even though they're conoidian carnivorans too. You've also got phalloidian carnivorans here, and you have them similarly befuddled, because civets and mongooses are both in the same parent clade, and hyenas have been genetically confirmed to be descendants of civets. Even though not all hyenas can interbreed anymore, not all civets can interbreed either, nor can all the viverids, yet all of these carnivorans have been confirmed to be genetically related. But, you know, that's just according to demonstrable, testable scientific facts and evidence, and believers don't care about any of that, because they have make-believe and the power of willful ignorance to ignore any inconvenient reality. On day six, God created his favorite people. Well, of course, it says we're his favorite. We wrote the story. We created God in our image, and then we pretend that he did that for us. Now, the other day, I was watching TV, and they said that, you know, people are just smart animals. Is that true? Yes, we are definitely animals, because the definition of an animal is any multicellular eukaryote organism with an internal digestive tract. And if that describes you, then it defines you. But as to how smart we are, I think the last several years of current events, as well as your own video series, have shown that we are nowhere near as smart as we like to think we are. Well, let's talk about what we have in common. We eat, we sleep, we drink, we walk on the earth, and we do have some similarities in our DNA. But that makes sense because we all live on the same planet. If we were magically created or otherwise unrelated to everything else, then we wouldn't have these similarities in our DNA. We would instead be markedly distinct. But the fact is that our DNA doesn't just have similarities, it has us firmly nested within the family of great apes, precisely, conclusively, and irrefutably. So how are we different? Let's look at what the Bible says. I think we've already established that the ignorant, primitive, superstitious savages who made up the fables in the Bible obviously didn't know what they were talking about, ever. The Bible says that we are special. We're the only ones that were created in the image of God. Then I have two questions. One, why aren't we invisible? And two, why does God have the image of an evolved ape with all the diagnostic characteristics of an ape? So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Let's take a look. First of all, we are not animals. Once again, we see that religious apologists haven't studied science and they haven't even adequately understood their own scripture either because the Bible says we are animals and it says that our refusal to admit that fact is due only to our vanity. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are in charge of the animals. You may have noticed, Mr. Bisbee, that when you worked at your former job, that everyone who was in charge of you was a human, just like you. The only difference being that they knew more than you. The other thing is, like God, people are very creative. We make paintings and music and videos. And when was the last time you saw a monkey build a spaceship? It just doesn't happen. Yes, it does. Earlier this year, I saw a few monkeys do exactly that. Their names were Bezos, Branson, and Musk. I'll put a link below explaining how we are monkeys. And here's a snippet from that video which addresses Bisbee's attempted denial of taxonomy. Imagine you get to interview the Night Industries 2000 from the TV show Knight Rider, and you tell it you've never had a conversation with a car before. 
But Kit argues that he is not a car, because he is smarter and generally better than any car, because mere cars can't talk like he can. Of course, you know that even a sentient automobile is still an automobile. So if you can't determine a rigid definition of exactly what that is, perhaps you could still prove the point if Kit will admit that being manufactured as a General Motors Pontiac Firebird Trans Am means it can only be a car. People deny their monkeyhood for the same reason, and that excuse can be refuted in the same way. You know, people also experience emotions on a much deeper level than animals. Incorrect. As usual, there are scientific studies to show that Bisbee is wrong again. Or should I say he is still wrong on every point, every time. But for me, this is the big one. God created us for relationships with each other and with him. So your evidence is your assumed conclusion for which there is no evidence, and you're using the logical fallacy of circular assumption as an argument against evidence to the contrary. I said in an earlier video that the question-begging fallacy is ubiquitous throughout religion, that religion is effectively based on that, and you're demonstrating that now, and you're about to demonstrate that one more time. I wanted to leave you with one final thought. I want to be alone with my thought. You know, when you take a look at all the amazing things that God has made and, and how complicated they are and how everything all works together, it's really obvious that these things didn't make themselves. Somebody really smart made them. And that's why the Bible says that when we look at creation, we have no excuse for not believing in God. My excuse is that I've read the Bible and it's really obvious that it was written by a collection of inferior beings. The cited verse is itself a celebration of the question-begging fallacy upon which all religion depends. Because it really is obvious that all these things evolved, that no one could have made them, nor would they have if they could have, when there is a system that can do that for them automatically. And religious apologists like Wavy Davy here are not very smart, holding to a host of unwarranted, indefensible, and unexamined assumptions based only on credulity. Bisbee. You don't know anything about science. That's obvious. You apparently don't know anything about theology or scripture either. But more important than all of that is that you demonstrate absolutely no concept of logic whatsoever. You assert baseless speculation as if it was a matter of fact and repeat demonstrably false and misleading claims. And you don't even understand how you've embarrassed yourself in every episode of this series. So I have to feel embarrassment for you because you evidently have no shame.